Take your seat. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boachi. The president of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, past presidents, vice presidents of the academy, fellows of the academy, your excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, On behalf of fellows of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, Ghana's premier learned society, I warmly welcome you all to day two of this year's Founders Week celebration on the theme, the socioeconomic and health impacts of COVID-19 and other emerging infectious diseases. We are live on all our social media networks, Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube. The Founders Week is the oldest of the academy's traditions. It started in November 1960 as the first anniversary celebration and has been held every November since then. It begins with the presidential address, which we had yesterday, and then uh, the, usually the induction of new fellows, which is followed by a two-day symposium on a subject of topical or national interest. The last day is dedicated to what used to be called the anniversary lecture, now renamed the Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Lecture in memory of Ghana's first president who established the academy. This year, we are delighted to announce that we have support from the following sponsors. SEND Ghana, West African Center for Cell Biology of Infectious Pathogens, University of Ghana, Legon the African Research Network for Neglected Tropical Diseases, located at the Kumasi Center for Collaborative Research in Tropical Medicine, and Dr. Ernest Kwaku, Chairman of the National Health Insurance Authority. We thank them all for their support. Tonight's event marks the commencement of a two-day symposium on the sub-theme, Responding to COVID-19 and Other Emerging Infectious Diseases in Society. It is to be addressed by two distinguished personalities who will be introduced shortly. My task is to introduce to you the chairman for this event. Our chairman for this evening is Professor Kofi Opokunti. Professor Nti is vice president of the arts section of the academy and a member of the council of the academy. He is a former dean of the University of Ghana Business School and the first occupant of the Unilever professorial chair in business at University of Ghana Legon. Professor Anti is a member of several academic societies, including the Public Choice Society, Institute for Operations Research and Management Sciences, and the European Association of Industrial Economists. He is a member of the Presidential Advisory Council on Science, Technology, and Innovation. Director of Universal, Universal Hospitals Group, Chairman of Claim Limited, 
and Chairman and Managing Director of Lemont Foods Limited. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our Chairman, Professor Inti. Professor Ita, it's my pleasure to also welcome you, um, President of the Academy, Vice President, former Presidents, and distinguished, distinguished ladies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and our dedicated students. Welcome. My job is to introduce to you our first speaker, Dr. John H. Amuesi. Dr. John Humphrey Amuesi is a senior lecturer at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, where he is head of the Global Health Department of the School of Public Health and leader of Global One Health Research Group at the Kumasi Center for Collaborative Research in Tropical Medicine, KCCR. Dr. Amuasi is also a W2 Professor of Global One Health at the Bernhard Nocht Institute of Tropical Medicine at the University of Eppendorf in Hamburg, Germany. An adjunct professor at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health in the USA, and an honorary visiting research fellow in tropical medicine at the University of Oxford in the UK. Dr. Amwasi trained as a physician in Ghana and later graduated from the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, USA, with postgraduate degrees terminating in a PhD in health research and policy. Dr. Amwasi set up and was the inaugural head of the research and development unit of the 25 of the 1200 bed Konfuanochi Teaching Hospital in Kumasi. For over 20 years, he has engaged in tropical medicine and global health research in LMICs, including malaria, NTDs, AMR, and One Health, and has published over 50 papers. He has also consulted for several global health focused organizations and supported civil society organizations with technical expertise on matters related to the access to drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics, as well as strategic advice related to global health research priorities. Dr. Amoasi's current research involves clinical and field epidemiology studies on malaria, emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases, AMR, snake bite, and other neglected tropical diseases. He currently serves as an executive committee member of EDCTP2 funded African Coalition for Epidemic Research Response and Training Alert, where he leads an op operational, the operational readiness and resilience work package of the network through alert at KCCR. He is coordinating research of the, on the clinical characterization of COVID-19 in Senegal, Guinea, Ghana, Cameroon, Uganda, Korea, and the DRC. Dr. Amuasi also serves as a principal investigator for a number of other studies on COVID-19 in Ghana, including some phase three clinical trials for drugs and vaccines involving both consortia and pharma. He further serves as co-chair of the Lancet One Health Commission, an adjunct to a number of academic institutions and as a regular technical advisor contributor to the WHO, Africa, CDC, and Africa Academy of Sciences, and several other global health organizations. Dr. Amwesi is passionate about mentorship and sustainability building, both clinical and non-clinical health research capacities in Africa. He's going to talk to us today about surmountable or not, addressing the challenges of emerging COVID-19 and re-emerging monkeypox infectious diseases. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Amoasi to take the podium. Now, thank you very much, um, Professor Chair, and uh, thank you very much to the distinguished uh, president and past presidents of the Academy and to all the uh, very honorable, venerable uh, fellows of the Academy. 
um, when I received the note that uh, I was being invited to speak, I, I, I thought of it as a very, very high honor and uh, I really want to express my appreciation for this opportunity uh, to share some thoughts um, with you. I'm also very pleased to see the students uh, here with us uh, this evening. I think some of these experiences are often uh, life-changing and, and help to, to shape your choices regarding career. So uh, I really congratulate the Academy for um, making this a priority. Uh, in the interest of time, I've been told I have 30 minutes and I have significantly more slides than would take 30 minutes. Uh, I'll dive straight into it and I will be obliged to skip uh, some slides. I, I, I'm also obliged to be turning my neck uh, from time to time um, so that I can, I can see uh, my own slides. So uh, as you are aware, the topic is, is right there. Um, I'm not going to tell you whether it is surmountable or not, but I'll allow you to, to make your own conclusions, so draw your own conclusions uh, based on um, a couple of uh, thoughts and also information that I would share with you. So it's going to be quite a, a potpourri of, of information um, that, that we have gathered that I will share with you, which, which hopefully will allow you to make a conclusion about um, whether this is surmountable or not. The focus on monkeypox and um, COVID-19 and also a few others. So a couple of acknowledgements, as you can see, there are no names or uh, logos on the slide because I, I thought it was too risky an endeavor uh, in, at such an exalted lectern. Uh, you don't want to make mistakes. Um, but at least one mistake I shouldn't make is to acknowledge uh, my teachers who have taught me um, all the way from my uh, primary school days and, and through to my postgraduate days and, and all those who continue to mentor me. Um, I cannot mention names, otherwise I will make a mistake or we will not leave here. Uh, so I really want to acknowledge them. And then particularly also uh, my team uh, currently at the KNUST uh, School of Public Health and the uh, Kumasi Center for Collaborative Research in Tropical Medicine, uh, KCCR, uh, where I lead the Global Health and Infectious Diseases Research Group. And we do a bunch of things, um, a, whole, a whole bunch of things. And you can see just a little bit of that um, over there, ranging from clinical trials through to field epidemiologic studies as well as uh, uh, social science type of research. It's quite, quite a large team. Uh, Steve Jobs made this statement, uh, and uh, he said, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to uh, trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. And this is how it is with a lot of the science that we do. It's easier to look back and say what went right and what went wrong and what might have been possible. It's a lot more difficult uh, to, to look forward. Nonetheless, um, we, we can use the information that we have at hand uh, gathered over the years to inform what might be in the future. And this is really important. So we live in the era of epidemics and pandemics. Uh, and there have been pandemics, epidemics over the years. Uh, over the decades and centuries, uh, but this is the modern era, and you can see right from 2003 with uh, SARS-CoV-1, right, that hit Southeast Asia, particularly Hong Kong, and a bunch of other places, and then swine flu, and then MERS in the Middle East, and then the avian flu epidemic, uh, and then fast forward to, to this really a critical point in global history, um, which has changed the face of our world forever, uh, the SARS-CoV-2, uh, pandemic, and then more recently, uh, the monkeypox, um, which uh, you know became of public health, global public health concern, uh, largely because it had hit the West. But we'd, we'd been living with monkeypox for quite some time, and we're particularly not bothered about it. So I remember when um, there was a suspected case of monkeypox that ten turned out to be a, a true case of monkeypox. Um, someone asked me, or people asked me, that what do you think? Is this going to be the next uh, um, COVID? I said, I'm not bothered about monkeypox at all. This thing has been around like forever. It's only because it's affecting a certain population uh, that it's now important to them, but uh, not bothered about monkeypox. And true to our word, we've not heard of a single fatality from monkeypox in Ghana, maybe just a few um, globally, not to speak of Africa. But that's not the focus for today. Uh, the idea is that. Uh, 
uh, there are phases of pathogen emergence, and I, I'm cognizant I need to move a little faster. Uh, there's always the pre-emergence phase, and this is where we often want to concentrate if we want to address uh, the, the drivers of um, epidemics and pandemics. It's really to be able to catch, to be able to catch it early, uh, so that we can avoid it. Uh, but also recognizing that there are there's a, there's a spillover phase at the human-animal interface, and then eventually the disease emerges. And then it becomes an epidemic and a pandemic largely on account of a number of human-mediated uh, factors. And, and recognizing that it is the human-mediated factors that are really at the heart of the spread of, of these emerging and re-emerging infections suggests that we can do quite a lot to control them because there's a lot in our hands and we are responsible for a lot of this. And these drivers tend to be uh, activities like deforestation, migrations, urbanization, and, and so on. Uh, particularly deforestation is a really interesting one. Uh, we have our own challenges uh, in our part of the world, in Africa, and particularly in Ghana, uh, the scourge of Galamse, and I'm sure many of you have traveled um, in Ghana and have seen what Galamse has done to our environment. It's really terrible. And the thing about Galamse is that it just renders the whole thing, the whole land useless, but it also puts human beings in closer contact with wildlife and increases the risk of, of emerging in infectious diseases. Um, Africa is not the only one in, in South America. They had these issues with the Amazon rainforest disappearing at an unprecedented rate. But as we say, thank God Bolsonaro is no more and uh, Lula is a little more friendly to the Amazon. So let's see what happens. Although he's now in, 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 in trouble today for having flown a private jet to the COP. Yeah, so, so much for standing, standing up for emissions. Um, let's take a, a short look at monkeypox, and then I'll speak a little bit about Ebola and then get into the COVID. Uh, so with monkeypox, it's, it was identified all the way in 1970. So this was before I was born. I have a lot of gray hairs, but I am very young. But the gray hairs helped me to get away with a lot, so I, I like them. Uh, so 1970, DRC, uh, monkeypox emerged. Uh, and then between 1970 and 1980, these were 59 cases. These are identified in Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia, Sierra Leone, DRC. And if you speak to colleagues in all these countries, they'll tell you, oh, you've been having this for a long time. Um, way before the so-called outbreak of monkeypox, I was part of a consortium that was looking into a clinical trial for monkeypox in the Central African Republic. This was as far back as uh, 2018. So things have been going on. It just was flying under the radar uh, the whole time. Okay, so I'll try and go a bit faster uh, with some of these. And serological surveys, really important. Serological surveys help us to understand what might have um, or likely happened in the past. And the serological surveys suggest that, um, really, uh, the disease has been with us for quite, quite a long time. And they found a substantially higher uh, seroprevalence among people living in the rainforest than those in the savanna, which points clearly to the human animal interface as being really the hot spot uh, for emerging infectious diseases um, and, and, and the need to focus on, on this the more. So fast forward into the 80s, uh, still a lot more information being uh, pulled out about monkeypox. And again, I have to just go a little bit faster um, with, with this. All right, so I've been advised to speak up a bit, and if my wife is following online, I'm sure she'll say, I, I've told you several times, uh, so I'll try. <laughs> um, so uh, intensive surveillance in the DRC, and then uh, in the 90s also there had been outbreaks, um, and civil unrest also led to many more uh, cases being detected, and you know, I have to go on because of time. Uh, some interesting results that, that showed some more serial prevalence. Uh, but essentially what we know is that it's endemic in 10 countries in Western Central Africa, uh, with the DRC being the hotspot. Now it's not surprising, the DRC always seems to be the culprit. Culprit with Ebola, culprit monkeypox, huge problem with uh, COVID. Uh, but well, if you think about where that, that country is located and the richness of the forests there, it, it is unsurprising. And the same with the country like Cameroon. 
So I, I would say that with, with DRC Cameroon, we're only just touching the tip of the iceberg, and I'm afraid what we will find if we look uh, hard enough, and as, as they say in our local parlance, so as we go looking, I'm sure we'll see a lot of it in some of um, in, in, in the blood uh, via the seroprevalence. Okay, but the interesting thing, the interesting thing is that the clade uh, for monkeypox in West Africa is, is a little different from that in the Congo Basin, suggesting that um, the emergence was de novo in West Africa, um, or not entirely de novo, but a completely separate, um, you know, uh, um, history of emergence in West Africa as opposed to Central Africa, which again points to the fact that uh, the risk is spread um, across the continent and really is a function of human-animal interactions. Okay, I'll go a bit faster now. Um, but the key point I wanted to raise is the fact that all the monkeypox had been in Africa for a long time. African scientists had been publishing on this, sounding the alarm. All fell on deaf ears until monkeypox arrived in the UK in, uh, in May earlier this year. And among a special um, uh, population, uh, the MSM population, then all of a sudden it became very important to the whole world. Um, I think this is a really, really important thing because uh, we saw how COVID was important to the whole world because it affected the whole world. But monkeypox had been with us since the 70s and nobody bothered about it um, until others um, were involved. I should tell you that if we are unlucky to have an epidemic which is localized to the continent, uh, we'll be pretty much on our own. And this is why it's important that uh, we conduct our own research and really try to understand what goes on in our part of the world uh, so we can find our solutions. And this is something that uh, Kwame Nkrumah, who um, uh, the, the, the foundation, the, the academy really reveres, uh, was very big on promoting uh, research. Uh, I was lucky I grew up here in Ghana in a research environment, and, and this was part of uh, one of Kwame Nkrumah's brainchild institutions, as with many others across the country. So, um, well, I'd say were we fairly lucky with Ebola? I think we were, um, because in Ghana we had no cases, even though we were among the countries at highest risk of uh, infection, uh, largely owing to how proximal we were to the countries that were affected, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, particularly because um, Ghana has the highest population of Liberians outside of Liberia. Um, it's not surprising that the United States was also at high risk. They had a few cases. But the fellow who uh, carried the disease to Liberia, actually, to Nigeria, was actually en route to Minnesota, which has the highest population of Liberians in the U.S. And he happened to pass through uh, Nigeria and, and fell ill there. So only God knows what could have happened. But Ghana was completely spared. Now, when you look at this uh, very carefully, these three countries are among the poorest in the West African sub-region. And if you juxtapose this, um, I'll just skip this one. Yeah, if you juxtapose this against a, a couple of indices, so I try to pull up a couple of indices to compare these countries. If you look at the Human Development Index, life expectancy at birth, uh, expected years of schooling, even GNI per capita, you would realize that there seems to be a, a relationship between quote unquote development and, and the risk of, of Ebola having emerged. Um, so here you see a strong relationship between um, economic advancement, so to speak, and, and risk of infectious disease outbreak. And this is what we have known all along, although, of course, COVID uh, came and, and challenged that very strongly. And, and this is why we like to think of COVID as being a bit of a paradox, because it defied all um, the, this, the standard knowledge and, and uh, an intuitive uh, knowledge that we've had regarding the risk of emergence of infectious diseases. Um, COVID has been different, it's been complex, it's been diverse uh, for various reasons. And, and the additional spanner uh, that was thrown into the works was uh, the various variants that emerged. And, and I, I like to think that the, the variants for COVID that have emerged, if you think right from the alpha through to the Omicron uh, currently, it's almost like a completely different uh, virus altogether. Uh, the, the, the degree of mutations. Now, I like to think that perhaps the COVID or the SARS-CoV-2 is perhaps the, the pathogen that has had the unique opportunity to undergo the, the fastest mutation maybe in the history of the world. I mean, I could be wrong, 
simply because it had the opportunity to be driven fast and hard across almost the entire world. I don't think any other species has had that opportunity uh, to, to, to move so quickly throughout the entire world and be exposed to so many different populations and so to be able to genetically modify itself to the point that um, the SARS-CoV-2 did. Um, and it's almost outdone itself now with Omicron, which is much, uh, spreads much faster but causes milder disease, but you can never tell what else it could morph into being such a smart virus. So the COVID-19 has revealed that there's a complex interplay of infectious disease with society and that really it is socio-ecological systems that may provide us an understanding of socio-ecological systems that could provide us with um, some of the answers that we need uh, to, to, to fully appreciate um, how COVID emerged and what it did to the world and also prepare us for what is to come next. You realize I didn't say what might come next. Uh, what is to come next is just a matter of time and these are the facts. I mean, before COVID emerged, I, I remember um, a year before then, I was in meetings uh, with the International Severe Acute Respiratory Consortium, uh, which I, with whom I work with, and we were discussing this scenario of a global pandemic um, involving a respiratory virus, and we developed some blueprints and some sleeping protocols and so on and so forth, and we predicted that it would be maybe five years down the line, uh, and, and we predicted it would be bad, but not as bad as COVID was. It was just a year later that COVID broke. Um, so this was known, it was known that it would happen, and we should know that there will be another, uh, hopefully, later. So COVID-19, if you, if you juxtapose this also uh, against the, the, um, the various indices that I showed you for Ebola, this time I did Ghana, Nigeria, the USA, Germany, Japan, and Cuba. And if you realize that these countries are all very interesting and unique in their own right, Ghana and Nigeria, we often like to compare ourselves for obvious reasons. It's a healthy competition. The US, uh, North America, powerhouse, Germany, European powerhouse, Japan, um, uh, Southeast Asian uh, powerhouse. And then Cuba is an outlier. It's supposed to be a poor country, but has a very solid health infrastructure. Um, and if you look at this, it's very hard to understand how COVID comes in because it doesn't seem to follow any particular pattern. It almost seems as if the more developed the country, the worse off they are with COVID. Um, and so it's not very clear. And this is why I pointed out that COVID is very complicated. Uh, and it tells us that um, it really requires a multidisciplinary approach um, to, to understand the various pieces. And I think we are only at the tip of the iceberg of, of unraveling um, what COVID is and what it did. Uh, so the complexity of the social ecological framework is what I think we need to appreciate even more, uh, right from the individual level through to uh, the complexity of public policy and what that means for various interventions. I, th I think you can scale back to what it was. There are just a few that will be distorted because of the size of the, of the screen. So uh, I've spoken to this already. I'll not spend time with it regarding the emergence of variants and what this even means. Um, but it's important to think about it in this way, that the solutions that have been put forward for COVID, many of them were very specific to our understanding at the time of the alpha, the beta variant. And now with this, uh, not only with the newer variants, but also the, the risk of new variants emerging, what this means is that we, we will need to be shifting the goalpost. We need to learn to be shifting the goalpost. It was thought initially that, oh, once you get the vaccination, we'll be out of the woods once everybody's vaccinated. Then it turns out that, no, uh, there are now mutations that would you know, almost bypass the vaccine altogether. And now we are going to be having regular updates of vaccines um, in order to be able to stay safe and so on. So uh, we, we have to live with that understanding that we'll need to shift the goalpost. And you cannot shift the goalpost blindly. You have to know where the ball is going and to shift the goalpost there. And this is where the science kicks in. Uh, the, it's a multidisciplinary science that we need to understand. Um, taking a closer look at COVID uh, and trying to understand, again, why it is so complicated in various ways, you can look at the numbers, just the numbers. Number of people infected, number of people tested, number of reported cases, number of hospitalizations, numbers of deaths. They are all interrelated, but also tell very, very different stories. They tell different stories because um, death is an ultimate state which is non-negotiable and, uh, and pretty well accepted by everybody. Death is what it is. 
but illness can be very different. And some people can be ill and say they are just fine. Some people will be ill and go to hospital because there is a hospital. Some will be ill and not go to hospital because there isn't a hospital. And some too feel that, okay, I'll self-medicate or I'm concerned about going to a facility. So uh, if you are measuring the intensity of the disease or the burden of disease just based on hospitalization or hospital visits, you, you could miss it altogether. Measuring it also just using death is not very helpful because, well, dead is dead and you really can't change anything about that. Uh, so it just tells you that understanding these numbers, although they are interrelated, is also a very important point, part of, of, of helping us to understand COVID and helping us to understand what or, or to figure out what decisions need uh, to be made uh, to improve the situation. Um, and again, COVID is perhaps not as um, as critical as it was a couple of uh, months ago or a year ago, but it means that for, for the upcoming pandemics, we would also need to consider what this means. And this was the reason why for me, when monkeypox broke, I was not bothered at all, because again, uh, risk of infection was not that, that high. And even if people are infected, uh, really what you are concerned about is secondary bacterial infection. Otherwise, it would be pretty much self-limiting and then go away by itself. Uh, so just understanding these things helps one to make decisions. Uh, we published a paper, myself and some colleagues, uh, and you can look for this in, in PLOS One. It said, does the data tell the true story? And we tried to model uh, early COVID-19 suppression and mitigation strategies in Ghana. And what, what we found is that, uh, and it, it's kind of a flip kind of uh, paper, we, we, we tried to prove that the information we have available does not tell us the true story. So we're making a case for better data collection. And we used whatever data was available in country in terms of uh, the numbers of infection uh, and a bunch of other indices. What we plotted here um, on, the, on the left side of, of the, of the y-axis is the r naught, the proverbial r naught, which we calculated based on the cases reported by the Ghana Health Service. And you can see uh, how uh, in the early days when um, the borders were closed and there were the lockdowns, um, it seemed to positively impact on the R0. But if you juxtapose this, and again, on the right side of my y-axis, you have the positivity rate. The positivity rate kept climbing higher and higher. The expectation would be that if your R0 is decreasing, your positivity rate would also uh, decrease. But you see something like this because the numbers or that we're recording, we're obviously not reflecting uh, the reality on the ground. These numbers were numbers that were reported through the health facilities, not re a real reflection of what was happening on the ground because until someone reports to health facility and until they get into the database, they will not be captured. And so this tells you again um, how unreliable hospital data would be or facility data would be in, in the event of epidemics or pandemics and, and calls into question how sensitive our surveillance systems are in, in quickly collecting data and making this available for decision making. Uh, we use this uh, method called the jackknife estimate. Um, the hypothesis here uh, that we had was, at least for the first couple of weeks when, when, when we had cases in Ghana, we we're doing the contact tracing, following everybody up. And so the argument is those numbers were fairly reliable. And if you use those estimates and the rate and um, juxtapose this over or, or, or project this over time, uh, what, what, we, what we said is that the positivity rate was overestimating the true incidence rate. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's still just a statistical tool, but it's pretty robust, at least for this first part of the, of the, of the pandemic, to show you that if, if you don't have the data, you'll really be, be groping in the dark. And it's so important that we are able to have the data to make decisions. Um, let, let me skip these because of time. Uh, this is, these are some examples of some things we got right uh, here in Ghana uh, during the uh, pandemic. Um, and there are also a number of things that we got wrong, but you'd realize that even pre-pandemic, we had the National Ambulance Service, we had just been bolstered, just before the pandemic hit, how lucky can you get? Um, there were more facilities, the Ghana East Hospital, where we have the uh, Ghana Infectious Disease Center, which was built in record time. Um, uh, had just been built or was just being completed, and so that served as the main COVID place. So a bunch of things that were done just before the pandemic hit, which, which helped us uh, to, to do well. And what very, one very interesting one is this Ghana drone delivery service. And you all remember the brouhaha with the drone thing, drone, drone, why are we doing drones? 
uh, it turns out that uh, COVID made the drones very, very useful. And I, I had a crude um, barometer for measuring the intensity of the, of the epidemic, which was just the, the, the rate of drone drops. So in my office at KCCR, and I used to sit there day and night, weekends, weekdays during the COVID, it was nice and quiet because nobody was coming to work. Thankfully, I had a pass, so I was allowed to come to work. And um, the drones would fly right over my office and drop it in the field at KCCR. So the, the more, and I would hear the drones when they are flying over. So the more the drones, it means that the, the more the cases. So when I hear the, more drones a day, I know it's not looking good at all. Um, but that is it for the drone. Uh, during the pandemic, also a number of things we did quite well, the handling at the airports and the setting up of the COVID task force under the office of the president, setting up of isolation centers, all these were great things that, that we did and I think we got very right. Um, but there are also a few things that uh, we didn't get uh, so right. Uh, these are still a number of things that we got right. I'm just going to skip all these. But a number of things we got wrong. We're not able to con control the infodemic sometimes of the conspiracy theories and so on. And this really affected uh, the rate of vaccine uptake, even, even among the educated. And, and we are academics here. I can, I can, we can say this without apology. Even among academics, I, I did a, a cursory, a cursory uh, survey during a uh, speaking session um, at KNUST, and I just asked how many have been vaccinated. And uh, it, it wasn't very impressive. And sometimes I'd hear some things that some academics would say about vaccination. I said to myself, oh, goodness me, we have quite a long way to go. Um, but this, again, because of the kind of information that was put out there, sometimes even in, um, in, in sources that would otherwise have been thought to be reputable. And, and so uh, because we, we got a few things right and a few things wrong, one may argue that were we just lucky in, in terms of the way things turned out here in Ghana. I was going to present some findings from some work that we did, because it's always nice to present actual uh, data, but because of time, I will skip some of these. Uh, two of these are the clinical characterization protocol and then the healthcare worker survey. I'll just show you very quickly. Uh, the healthcare worker survey is one we did very early in the pandemics, one of the first studies uh, that we conducted here in Ghana. And perhaps it, was the, it is the largest, actually, uh, the largest um, healthcare worker survey that was conducted globally. Uh, we're hoping to publish our study uh, our findings very, very soon, but involved um, over 4,000 healthcare workers in Ghana. Now, the reason why we got that, those large numbers were, was because uh, we're smart enough to tie it to, to CPD, both at Medical and Dental Council, at the, at the uh, Pharmacy Council and others. And because there was a lockdown and no CPDs were ongoing, that was about the only CPD you could do. So um, to, to access the CPD, you need to take the survey. And this is why we got such large numbers of, of people taking the survey. And, and this is the distribution that we had. I had some, some, some results from this, but I'll just scroll through them. And, and, and you can drink in whatever catches uh, your eye. Uh, because of time, I cannot go um, deeply into, into each of them. Um, so we looked at even just concerns about getting ill and distribution among different uh, caters of health professionals. Uh, we looked at a few other things. Um, these are the results, um, some of the results that we had. So many, many healthcare workers were pretty much petrified and their risk of getting the disease and the risk of dying. And we know a good, a good number of colleagues who, who died in the, in the line of duty on account of COVID. Um, and not to speak of the, the emotional and mental trauma that um, COVID placed on healthcare workers. And now we know about even long COVID and the psychological effects of long COVID, which some people still suffer from. Um, and thankfully, uh, we're, going to be starting, uh, we're going to be starting a long COVID um, case uh, cohort study uh, very soon uh, with some funding from, from the Wellcome Trust. All right. Uh, one very interesting thing, I'll just go back, is that the males witness significant increase in their well-being relative to females. And that's, that's also very interesting. It just shows you that, that, that even among healthcare workers, there are some, there are some differences uh, by age and also by sex um, with regard to, to well-being uh, during uh, times like this. Uh, another one uh, is the clinical characterization protocol. I've not spent time with this. But it's a couple of over 2,000. Now we have over 3,000 um, clinical records uh, for COVID. 
uh, and this is the distribution that we have, uh, majority being Ghanaian, um, and this was conducted mainly at the uh, Ghana East Hospital and at the Ghana Infectious Disease uh, Center. Um, now this is an interesting one. Uh, you see that majority uh, of these had tertiary education and it tells you who is more likely to report to the hospital when they are ill. So you often used to hear um, people saying that, oh, it's the disease of the rich, it's the disease of the educated. Um, well, it's the rich and the educated who report to health facilities. And this fact was borne out by the several prevalence studies which we conducted showing that in actual fact, uh, the lower socioeconomic status had higher serial prevalence than the higher socioeconomic status, or lower educational level had higher serial prevalence than higher education level, uh, which, which is really what you expect, but it is masked by um, healthcare seeking behavior and, and hospital records, which of course would, would cater to those who are supposedly knowledgeable and more afraid, and so will come to the health facility. So these are again very important points to note. The reason I'm showing all this is that it tells you that what we found in Ghana with respect to the risk factors and, and clinical presentation was no different from what is known in literature and what pertained all over the world. Um, all these are things that is not, not very different. It just tells you that um, COVID was, the way in which COVID panned out in Ghana, at least with regard to risk of infection, spread um, of the infection and the clinical presentation was no different from the rest of the world. Um, even duration of admission, of course, we looked at length of stay, uh, even mortality, and we see significantly higher mortality among males than among females. And, and these risk factors, which were well known, um, older age, that's about 50, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, a significant, uh, were significant predictors of death, or, or, or uh, they, they, were, they were significant risk factors uh, for death no different from what uh, we have uh, globally. But in all this, I, I like to say that I, I think that not only Ghana, but in Africa, we were pretty lucky. Often our, um, our governments in Africa like to say, oh, we did very well with doing lockdowns and shutting the borders. Yes, we did very well. This is there's no, no, no two ways about that. I showed that. But it, I'm convinced that it's not what we did that led to the outcomes we had. It's much more complicated, and to some degree, we were very lucky, uh, very, very lucky, I think. So uh, the expected picture when, Af when, when COVID broke was that Africa was going to be a graveyard. It, it, wasn't, an unfounded, it wasn't an unfounded expectation, and, and even personally, I, I was very alarmed. There were many times at night I would wake up, just sit on my bed quietly and wonder, if this was the end of the world, and had good reason to think so, because the direction in which things were going was really bad, and it looked like as soon as it spread in Africa, it was going to be the end of us. Of course, in Europe, they were just running helter skelter and was looking very bad. But it didn't, it didn't uh, pan out that way. But if you look at the proportion of positives among the total COVID tests con con conducted, Africa comes second. Well, this is an, uh, looks like an anomaly, but it's only because there were much fewer tests in Africa. And the testing was largely uh, based on suspicion of being a case, and therefore the probability of being positive was much higher. So it's less tests and more purposive tests. So this is a total artifact, but it just tells you, again, that if you, if, since we did not have sentinel sites for routine testing to understand um, the intensity of the spread across the country, we really had no idea of how deeply it was spreading. And it's only later that several prevalence studies show that the thing really went very, very far, very, very far. And the serial prevalence was as high as over 40% way before vaccines landed in the country. And I'll show you some of that in a bit. Uh, if you look at the case fatality ratios, however, Africa was way down there, way down there. And this, again, is a paradox. So how do we unravel this African paradox? Um, a lot of things have been said. Was it the favorable climate? Was it that we acted very quickly in Africa with the lockdowns and so on? Was there a lot of public support for the lockdowns and compliance with um, the, the measures, the hand washing and so on and so forth, and the mask wearing? Well, um, 
I, I, I try to, to pick these apart one after the other. I cannot go into depth because of time, uh, but one after the other uh, dispose of all these theories has not been able to, or these hypotheses has not been able to hold much water. Um, pure chance or luck, well, in, in science we don't deal with luck or, or chance, although of course I said we were lucky by the outcome. So it, it really is not just a question of luck. There's something on the line and it's science that would help us um, to, to unravel and understand uh, why we had what we, why what, what we had, because Africa should not have been very different from, from the rest of the world. The temperature, uh, I think perhaps it's a very weak argument, uh, because in the Middle East, uh, in Southeast Asia, even in Australia, they have temperatures that are much warmer than we do. So it was just the hot sun. Uh, there's plenty of it elsewhere. And so the hot sun uh, was not necessarily our savior um, from COVID. Although, of course, we know that when the, when the weather is colder, the virus can survive for longer, and of course, people are indoors more, and so there's increased risk of spread. Um, so, so this is, this is uh, not, not a very uh, strong one. Then testing capacity, um, people argue that, oh, because testing was low in Africa, uh, this is why we don't have the full picture. It is to some degree true, um, but in some countries, they did quite a lot of testing um, South Africa and Egypt and a bunch of other countries did quite, uh, quite some testing. Is it uh, just experience and exposure? Was it, is it cross-reactivity with some other um, viruses? But there's also very weak evidence in this direction. SARS-CoV-2 is pretty novel. And, and cross-reactivity was not something that was found to be highly prevalent. So it couldn't be that we had antibodies to something else that was kind of protecting us from SARS-CoV-2. So that also is, is another weak one. Um, and the others who think that, in actual fact, the deaths were just like everywhere else, except that uh, we were not uh, measuring or, record, or recording those deaths in Africa. But I, I strongly... Um, oppose this view because death is a very hard outcome to hide, especially in our part of the world uh, where, where we, we, we take death very seriously. Um, if you look at what happened in the Indian subcontinent, um, they, they are said to have captured barely 10% of their deaths, uh, but still it was very clear that they were dying in record numbers. Um, satellite imagery in South America showed huge deaths in Brazil, um, Nicaragua and other, other parts of South America. Um, and, and so if there was that much uh, death in Africa, it would have shown up. I do think, yes, we underreported under the deaths, but not to the degree uh, which could have been massively missed. So my argument is that uh, uh, the mortality trends tell us that the impact of COVID in Africa, and Ghana is no exception, was relatively low. However, the disease was present with us, spread as far and as wide as it did in other parts of the world. The clinical presentation and outcomes um, in terms of you know, you know, um, bi biochemical or physiological were, were very similar to other parts of the world, but the ultimate outcome of death was very different. The question is why? I do not have the answer, but at least I have enough to show you that there was less death in Africa and this is why, where we need to investigate further. I won't spend too much time, but some people did some work on looking at obituary uh, websites in Kenya and suggested that, oh, there were many more obituaries. But this was done in only a small part of Nairobi. And that's not surprising, of course, uh, because this was uh, the, rich, the rich part of the country. Uh, some people did some work on geospatial, doing geospatial analysis uh, for grave digging in Somalia. Um, and they found that the rate of grave digging was much higher, almost more than twofold uh, during the height of the COVID. Well, that's fine, I could agree with you, but it was only twofold, only, not that, it's, not that we can discount death. But if you compare relative to the rate of grave digging in, in Europe and grave digging in North America and in South America, I mean, two times was just way under the bar. So it just tells you that, yes, we did miss a good number of deaths, but the death was definitely much, much, much lower. And um, again, I can, I can buttress this with some of the seroprevalence studies uh, that, um, that we conducted. And we did one here in Ghana. And I'll just show you some of the findings from there. We did uh, one in Kumasi, uh, one in Accra, and then one in Tamale. Uh, these are three uh, major urban areas in Ghana. Uh, it involved collection of samples. Uh, it was community-based. That's a very interesting thing. We actually went to houses 
It was not a very easy um, endeavor. I remember there was one house in Kumasi that the team, my team visited, and um, they were literally chased away. Uh, and uh, something, it was very interesting. The lady uh, told them to wait, and then the team heard her shouting and calling her husband that these are the people that the prophet spoke about. Uh, they'll be coming to your house to collect some blood. Don't allow them to collect blood. And so when the team heard that, they just took to flight. It's not looking good for them. They quickly ran away. There was another case, and this was in Accra. I received a, a strange phone call. I picked it. It was a police inspector who said that somebody had come to the police station to report that people came to her house and took her blood. And uh, someone has told her that that was, that was very wrong. And so she's uncomfortable and decided to uh, report to the police. Now, she was able to report and to, and my number was available because we did the right thing. We had the ethics clearance, we had the consent form, and my number was on there as the principal investigator. So I explained to the good officer uh, that, well, we're doing our research, we have all the necessary clearances, and he should take a good read of that paper she's holding. She consented to the study. Um, so I gave her the option, do you want us to take your results out? And she said, oh, no, 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 but she wants to see the results when they are ready. I said, sure, we'll send that to you, and we did that. Uh, but it's just an example of how doing community-based studies that involve uh, taking of biological samples can be a huge challenge in our part of the world. And this was an ELISA-based test, so really state-of-the-art um, um, test, um, which is the gold standard. And this is how far we went um, all over the country. So these are some pictures from the field. I don't spend too much time uh, there, but it's really uh, community-based. So you see the work in the community and then uh, the bespoke work in, in the lab. These are some of the findings. This is only the findings from Tamale, uh, um, and I just wanted to show you this so you see the distribution by gender, the distribution by age, and the distribution by educational level. And you can see right here that pre-secondary 78% positive and tertiary 64% uh, positive, and the secondary was this. Um, and then even if you look at the age distribution, pretty similar, male, female, not very different. Um, but very interesting. This is just a summary. Um, no, this is, this is also for Tamale in particular. You can see the IgG uh, positivity, um, um, and the percentage there. I have to go a little faster. I think German is how many more minutes? It's, it's time is up. Okay. I'll just uh, quickly round up. I may have to stop at a point. I may not be able to continue and finish. But this just tells you the seroprevalence overall. Uh, close to 60%, or shall I say, let's say, maybe to, to be fair, not be about 55% overall. Um, and then Kumasi, uh, just about 40, Accra about 40. Tamale was, was close to 70%. Now, this was also because of the, the, time, the time gap. We started in, in 2021 and then ended in February 2022, with Tamale being the last place. A very, very high seroprevalence, not different from what we saw in other parts of, of the world. And, and this study, what I'm very proud about the study is that some of the funding came from in-country, from the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, trust fund, and Dr. Sari is, is here. Um, uh, thank you. Um, and, and they provided some of the money for us to do this kind of work. We got some of the money from some partners, but being able to go to Tamale and Accra was because of funding that we got internally. And it tells you that if we fund these kinds of activities, we can do a lot more. So um, I will stop here. I had a little more meat. Um, I wanted to go into a few more things, but I think I have to stop here. Uh, I think that the point is, is made, uh, and I'm hopeful that uh, we can get deeper into this and, and using uh, the multidisciplinary approach. I wanted to speak particularly to the One Health approach. I was going to go into that and what that means. We can uh, better understand what happened and also prepare better for what will happen. So thank you very much. Let's give him another hand of applause. Very interesting research they've been doing. Um, the, the program was that the second speaker would speak and then we would ask questions. But Dr. Morsi has to travel. So we're going to have you um, use some five minutes to ask him questions that you may have on his talk. So let's do that right now. We need the microphones to go around. Please introduce yourself, and then you can ask your question. I think there's the first one here. Okay. 
And thank you very much um, for Samuasi for that wonderful lecture. I mean, thank you. Really very illuminating. I'm Jumwa Edu, Dr. Edu, and I'm a kidney specialist, and I could chair um, the Ghana Academy Health and Sanitation Committee, and we had an interaction. You were very helpful when we were doing some of our thinking. And I, I'm really pleased that your conclusion was that we had a lower mortality. It was not because we were lucky. Because, you know, I think for the benefit of the students, luck and science don't <coughs> go very closely hand in hand. So why was the mortality in sub-Saharan Africa, excluding South Africa, where I think their mortality was higher, why was it lower than in Europeans? Okay, that's easy to explain, because one can say that we have genetic differences, or as you pointed out, maybe exposure to other viruses. So I think that that genetic differences, different viral exposure. But then again, African Americans um, had a particularly high mortality. And of course, we share quite a significant um, genetic, um, you know, or they share genetic f backgrounds with us. Now, they have U quite a lot of European admixture maybe 15 to 20%. So I really just want to probe why was the mortality so low in much of sub-Saharan Africa? Because I think that would be really quite helpful in understanding further or future epidemics. Thank you. Let's get more questions, and then he will answer the questions at the end. So somebody's here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Emos La. Um, a lecturer at the University of Ghana School of Public Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Emosi, for um, this exciting presentation. I, I think through your nicely told uh, story, um, we have picked up, as I say, I have picked quite a number of things. Uh, one, uh, what we do know about uh, Ebola, monkeypox, and then COVID-19. But to some extension, what we should know, and therefore what we should do. Uh, that which I didn't get a lot to learn uh, from you has to do with what we should do. Not just what we should do with the present uh, pandemic, but what we should do in anticipation for uh, future pandemics, which you noted would come when they come. Um, you probably did not have time to go through all your slides. Maybe you had that in mind. If you could take a minute or two to let us know what we need to do in anticipation for the next pandemic. We do know uh, failing to plan is exactly as planning to fail. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Richmond Daite with the University of Ghana School of Public Health. Um, you told us about what worked and then also what didn't work so well. Uh, I tend to see that some of the things that worked were things within healthcare and medical control. That's the impression I was getting. The ones that then go into how we live and uh, the social um, environment and, and the things that are not within the power of the health system appears to be the one that didn't really work so well. Could you comment a little bit on that? Thank you. Thank you. We need some questions from the students. I invite you. <laughs> yes. Okay, my name is Gali Eric Asari. When U.S. approved a vaccine for monkeypox, was it able to get to Africa, especially DR Congo? Thank you. One more. All right. If not, then I'll add one question. In your diagram, you had this scary image of a snake ready to bite, but you didn't comment on the snakes. 
So please comment on that too. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. I'd prefer to, uh, to stand. Right, yes. Uh, thank you very much uh, once again for those questions. Um, the first one was um, why the higher or the lower mortality in, in Africa. Um, so I couldn't go much deeper into some of my hypotheses, but I, I think you pretty much ended up with the same hypothesis that I have, um, which is that uh, there must be a, a genetic answer, or the answer is in, is in genetics, and that we have not explored fully. Um, the, the African American population and the uh, Africans in Europe population um, actually suffered more than uh, the whites, or let me just put it simply, uh, the blacks actually suffered more than the whites in Europe and in North America. So it's almost on the flip side, and the answer is why. It, it just tells you the complexity of the interaction between this virus as a, um, a biological entity and, 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 and then the socio-ecological system. Because of that, that factor called poverty and, and the socioeconomic gradient, um, those, uh, th those populations often tend to be in, in the lower uh, socioeconomic quintiles. And this put them both at higher risk of the disease and at risk of worse outcomes. Again, because a lot of them also suffer disproportionately from a lot of the, uh, the risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, and so on, which puts them at, at a much higher risk of poor outcomes. So it's, it's both a risk of infection because of lifestyle being accentuated, as well as uh, underlying factors uh, like uh, non-communicable diseases and uh, lower access to interventions that could help them uh, to have uh, better outcomes. Um, on the other hand, in our part of the world, um, although there are disparities, um, the bar is much lower. And so when the bar is below a certain point, even though there would still be a gradient, it's still low enough that everybody is almost equally at risk to some degree. Even that, even that, via seroprevalence studies, you still find some gradient within the level, level of education, although not statistically significant. Um, I had some slides um, uh, on, on, on what I think the role of pharmacogenomics uh, would be in trying to understand uh, even response to the COVID vaccine and response to COVID therapeutics. But think about it. This continent, Africa, has about 98% of the world's genetic variation, which, and we've only just about touched the tip of the iceberg. You think about it, um, a country like South Africa, and you rightly pointed out South Africa as being an outlier. And, and, and I don't have the answer, but when you think about it, South Africa gave the world beta. It also gave the world Omicron. Now, what is the chance that a single country would lead to two major variants globally? There must be something in there. Um, and, and, and is it that we missed other variants that may have emerged from other countries? Is it that it did not emerge in South Africa? Yeah. Oh, well, I realize I could go on and on. This question was a trap <laughs> because it's a really good question. I could go on and on into it. But I just really think that, indeed, uh, the answer may lie in, um, in, in genomics. And, and investigating that across the continent may provide us with some important answers, although it could be very interesting because when you get into genomics, uh, it can get a bit tricky when it comes to policy. Second question um, from Prof. La, you asked about what we should do. I did have some good slides on what we should do. Because of time, I'll go straight to the point. What I think we should do is to adopt a One Health approach to integrated surveillance. What this means is having a surveillance system that um, addresses animal health, um, health at the human-animal interface, and then human health. But having this all in one place, being able to analyze it and interpret it uh, to inform what the risk is uh, and to inform what uh, the, the, in the interventions should be. Um, uh, this One Health approach has been um, accepted as the way to go, and now we have the One Health high-level expert panel, the OLEP, that has come up with a, uh, a world-accepted definition of One Health and has actually developed a framework for this kind of global surveillance mechanism. It was launched in Berlin. I was fortunate to be there just a couple of weeks ago, 
Uh, and I strongly recommend that you look for this, um, this document, which was launched by the One Health High Level Panel. Um, and, and I'm looking forward to its adaptation in Ghana here to our local uh, situation. So just in a nutshell, what we should do is an integrated One Health surveillance system. Uh, that, that should help us to, to understand better and move forward. Uh, Prof. IT, your question on um, the uh, uh, on on you know beyond just the the biomedical the, or, or the or the uh, medical field, I really think that the answers lie there. I have uh, I have made mention of why we saw the flip side of the blacks in 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 North America and in Europe as opposed to in Africa. That tells you that the role that um, that socio-ecological systems uh, that play in risk of disease and, uh, and outcomes, both clinical outcomes and health outcomes, is high. And, it, and if you don't understand that framework well, which cannot be understood using just biomedical science, but this is where uh, the social science comes in and the arts come in, especially if you're thinking about communication and trying to get messages down to people and to modify behavior, then you will not succeed. If you understand how um, Ebola was tackled in West Africa. It was not the biomedical science. It was actually the social anthropologists that did the trick for us, but that's for a different day. So, so I, I agree with you. Uh, yes, we, we got some of the biomedical things right, but I think we really did not understand what happened at the socio-ecological level, and it's something waiting for us to investigate. And then uh, the question on the monkeypox um, vaccine. Yeah, there is a vaccine for monkeypox that is out there. We don't have it here. Uh, we're not that important, excuse me to say, but that's what they like us to think. And it's a shame because we've always had the disease since the 1970s. Vaccine is now available, and it's available where they think it's important for them to have it. Uh, so we're pretty much on our own. And this is why it's important that we conduct our own indigenous research. And now that we'll soon have a vaccine research uh, place and a vaccine manufacturing place, hopefully we should be able to do some of these things ourselves. Uh, so that's what it is. And the last question on the snakes. Well, uh, that was just a, a, um, a picture showing some of the research my group does. So part of what we do is snake bite research. Um, uh, and and um, uh, we, we have looked at the epidemiology of snake bite in Ghana and found that the, the highest burden is in the Upper West in terms of per capita. Um, but interestingly, the second highest numbers of snake bites are in the Shanti region of Ghana. As a challenge of suppliers of antivenom, with some antivenom being actually of Indian origin, which does not address the snakes that we have here. But that's a different lecture. That's why you saw snakes there. So thank you very much once again for having me. I really appreciate it. And thank you very much. And I'll excuse myself. So, um, We'll wait for, for you to leave, yeah. Then I'll just, I'm going to introduce him. Yeah, sure. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much. Our second speaker is Professor Peter Lamte. He's a fellow of the Academy. And his talk today is on the hard-earned lessons from past pandemics hold the key to combating current and future pandemics. Let me give you a short bio of Professor Lamte. Professor Peter Lamte, Professor Peter Richter Lamte is a fellow of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, has been a professor of global non-communicable diseases the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, with joint appointments in the Faculty of Epidemiology and Population Health and at the Faculty of Public Health and Policy since 2012. Currently, he's a distinguished scientist and president emeritus at FHI 360. He's an internationally recognized public health physician and expert in developing countries with particular emphasis on communicable and non-communicable diseases. With a career at FHI 360 spanning more than 30 years, he has been instrumental in establishing FHI 360 as one of the world's leading international non-governmental organizations in implementing HIV AIDS prevention care, treatment, 
and support programs. His experience in HIV AIDS efforts internationally includes collaboration with the World Bank to design and monitor the China Health 9 HIV AIDS project. He directed several global USAID funded projects, AIDS projects, um, AID, AIDS Tech, AIDS Cap, and Impact, 1987 to 2007, in several developing countries. For over 45 years, Professor Lamte Spears have commended his remarkable and outstanding global and local contribution to public health, spanning contributions on well-known and landmark Danfa Comprehensive Rural Family Planning Project, and leadership in the global response to the AIDS epidemic in Africa, Asia, Eastern Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean. He has also provided public health service by serving on several international technical committees, such as the National Academy of Science of the USA and the Lancet Commission. As recently as 2019, he served on the National Academy of Sciences Committee to formulate an agenda for integration of communicable and non-communicable diseases. So we are, we are delighted to have a very distinguished person talk to us on this particular topic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm delighted to be here today to uh, talk about experiences, global experiences um, in uh, pandemics. But because of the large student population, I'll try and make things a little simpler so that you understand, and hopefully uh, some of you will make career, uh, create careers in this discipline in, in the future. The topic is a challenging one because there have been epidemics recorded in history as far back as 10,000 BCE, and we also know of the modern epidemics like HIV and COVID uh, uh, and some of the newer ones in the last uh, few decades. So I'm going to try and give you a very brief review uh, of not only the epidemics that have occurred over the last 10,000 years, but also talk about the current epidemics and how, do we, how we prepare ourselves for future epidemics like the one that we are facing now with COVID-19. For the, again, the students and those whose area of specialty is not this area, I'd like to uh, define a few terms to make it easier for you to understand. When I use the term epidemic, it means an outbreak of a disease that occurs over a wide geographical area and affects a, a very high proportion of the population. Ebola is a good example of an epidemic. It affects several countries in Africa, both West Africa, uh, uh, Eastern and Southern Africa. On the other hand, a pandemic is a very large epidemic that affects not only continents, but of large populations all over the world. And the best examples are HIV pandemic, uh, as well as the COVID-19. But I'm going to now focus on pandemics uh, for most of my talk. Impacts of epidemic. As you learn towards the end of the discussions, the economic and social impact are sometimes more devastating than the ill health or the deaths that occur. And then the other uh, aspect of pandemics that you also learn about is the social unrest that they create. It creates usually worsened social inequality in the populations that it affects. Um, but one thing that, uh, one of the best things that we have learned over the years is the improvement in the medical response, the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment so that we are better prepared for future epidemics. And that's, those are some of the things that I'll talk about over the course of my presentation. I'm going to briefly describe some of the Asian pandemics. I, I won't spend too much time. Smallpox uh, caused what we call the plague of Athens as far back as 430 BC. 430 BC means the time before Christ was born. Uh, then the other, there was another small epi uh, smallpox epidemic uh, a few hundred years later. 
then two epidemics caused by what we call bubonic plague, terrible epidemic that kills uh, a lot of people. Those also occurred uh, uh, 450 before uh, VC, and then even as far as recent as the 14th century, as well as other uh, pandemics. The small, small pox epidemic, the first one that has been recorded in history occurred 10,000 years ago, and it's caused by a virus, um, and the symptoms usually include rashes, fever, severe fatigue, uh, but it killed about 30% of the people that it affected. Okay, that's a very high mortality. Uh, one epidemic or pandemic that you, all of you may be aware of is the flu, which only kills less than 1% of people. So if you have a pandemic that kills 30% of people, that's a very severe uh, uh, impact. And uh, the small epidemic that occurred that far back killed one third of all survivors, uh, sorry, 30%, which is one third, and another third also went blind. Dr. Jenner, who lived in the 18th century, came up with uh, vaccination for smallpox as early as 1749, and that's what helped um, uh, reduce the impact of smallpox uh, epidemics later. And then, as a, a result of the work that has been done over the years, in 1980, smallpox was completely eradicated from, from the surface of this earth. This is a patient with severe smallpox. This is the reason why it kills so many people other when we had no uh, vaccines and we had no treatment for it. The plague of Athens is again one of the most important epidemics. Um, it lasted for 25 years. Uh, the symptoms include fever, vomiting, bleeding, skin lesions, and diarrhea. Um, we now, because this happened so long ago, it's very difficult uh, for us to be able to determine the actual, whether it was smallpox or the actual pathogen. And recently, because of the Ebola epidemic, some uh, scholars believe that Ebola also could have been responsible for this particular outbreak. Um, and this particular plague in Athens, Greece, set back civilization of the whole world for centuries because of the impact that it had. And this shows you, these are the doctors uh, at the time paying house visits. And uh, the knowledge about the uh, pandemics was so uh, low that doctors at the time thought that what, uh, the outfits that they are wearing, including the beak of a bird, could, would prevent them from getting the, uh, the disease. We have come a long way, obviously. Uh, the Black Death is another pandemic that occurred in Europe and Asia, and uh, it started when several ships arrived from Europe in 1347. It carried fleas that transmitted the disease uh, as far as on the clothes of uh, the travelers, and it killed 50 million people uh, in that particular epidemic. Again, this is a terrible epidemic, and we were talking of the time when the population of the, of the world was much lower than it is now, and yet 60% uh, of the population of Europe uh, uh, got killed with this epidemic. The Black Death is another one that occurred, and it was so severe that it's considered to this date that it was mother of all the pandemics. Uh, 500 million people were infected, Mortality was high, especially those under five, under 20 to 40, and those over 65, and 52 million people died. Okay, these numbers probably don't mean a, a lot to you, but you're talking of huge amounts of people, a disease that simply kills one person after the other. Fortunately, we have effective vaccines uh, now, and uh, this uh, pandemic has been controlled, uh, and we haven't had a uh, there's such severe mortality uh, in recent times. The Spanish flu is another one that occurred, and it was so severe and so devastating that they had to hire special police to make sure people stay at home and they don't come out of the streets to spread the disease. This is, this is one of the... And HIV pandemic, 
It's my favorite subject because I was involved with it for, for 20 years. Uh, um, U.S. government provided funding for, for, for us to have programs in about 65 countries. Um, and we, over the 20-year period that we intervened, we were able to have a, an, imp an impact on slowing down the epidemic and preventing further spread. Unfortunately, it's one of the epidemics that have never gone away because we haven't been able to find a vaccine, but I'll tell you a little bit more about it later. This is the U.S. Uh, government response. When this epidemic started in 1987, uh, we we're, were given a funding of about $28 million to pr uh, uh, so support programs in about 20 countries. Uh, that's what was called ASTEC. I directed three of the programs, the ASTEC program, the ASCAP program, which was $200 million, uh, over a period of five years, and the last one was the IMPACT program, uh, that was $400 million. And we, uh, as I said, this epidemic was so devastating that uh, it cost, it affected 84 million people globally, 40 million, almost 50% of the people who got HIV died. Um, but fortunately, because of our efforts and the efforts of a lot of other countries and a lot of other people all over the world, uh, it's now hardly anyone dies from HIV because of the treatments that are available. Uh, but we still have 38 million people living with HIV. Um, and uh, in 2021, only 1.5 million newly infected people uh, were recorded. And uh, a lot of people, almost 30 million, of few, million people, according to, uh, to UNAIDS, are still on antiretroviral therapy. So it's one disease where, which has had devastating impact, but because of science, advancement of science, uh, we've managed to contain it, as, and it's now a low-level uh, uh, pandemic compared to what it was 20 years ago. COVID is the next big pandemic, okay? And you all have been witness to this because of a lot of you in this room, I'm sure, have even suffered from it. That started only uh, three years ago, and it's caused by a respiratory virus spread through air and surfaces. But the response, like other epidemics in history, are usually characterized by fear and fear leads to delays, and it leads to further spread of the disease. Fatality was low, and only 4 million people have died from COVID, but it's affected 200 million people, and we still don't have an effective vaccine, uh, and we don't have an effective cure, but it's be, we've been able to contain it. This is an, an interesting way uh, with China has responded to COVID pandemic. And I don't know how many of you have been following this, but in the last several weeks, there have been uh, protests in China because of the drastic and draconian way that China handled the epidemic. The, as soon as you are tested and you have COVID, you are put in quarantine, whether you have symptoms or not, until you are uh, COVID negative. And th this is from one of the awards. Here is a guy who obviously feels well, um, and yet he's been... Uh, uh, it's together with people with severe disease or moderate disease, and it's not, not the way to handle it. It's one of the most expensive ways uh, to do it, and it's had a devastating impact on the economy of China. Now, let's lo look at, uh, so far I've talked about the uh, health impact. Let's talk about the economic impact of COVID. It has been probably the most devastating epi uh, pandemic uh, of all the pandemics that have occurred in terms of economic impact. The global supply chain uh, crisis was caused and is still ongoing. It's called the second largest global recession in history. Uh, recession means that the economy simply stopped functioning as, as well as it, sh it should. Um, it has caused a stock market crash. Um, it's contributed to a uh, global energy and food crisis. 80 to 90 percent of travel, global travel, was cancelled as a result of, the, of this pandemic. 30 million jobs were lost in the first quarter of 2020, according to the International Labour Organization. And there was loss of employment, 
high loss of employment among women, the poor, and migrant workers. And remember what I said earlier, it invariably has a greater impact on the lower socioeconomic group, the poor uh, who can least afford to lose their jobs, invariably they are the ones, and it costs the global economy $12.5 trillion. That's one of the most devastating economic impact that any disease has ever had on the global economy. And this is how much it costs to respond. 11 trillion, 1 trillion in future losses, and then also it costs us $39 billion just to prepare for the COVID response. Um, and this graph shows you the three major impacts from 1996 on to 2024 uh, of things that have affected the global economy. As you can see, the Asian financial crisis, that's the first one, that was around 1997. Um, the global financial crisis, and then the great lockdown on the right side as a result of COVID. And it, had, it has had greater impact than all the other economic. Uh, so that shows you the impact that a disease can have. What are the lessons? This is the crust of my presentation. What are the lessons that we have learned uh, from these uh, pandemics uh, that I've described? One reminder is that pandemics only started happening when we evolved from hunter-gatherers to agrarian societies, agrarian meaning farming societies, uh, because we started li living in larger groups, larger populations, and therefore, it was easier for uh, uh, pandemics to spread within these societies. And, and also, war was a major contributive factor in spreading uh, diseases to other uh, parts, conflicts, wars, and also social upheavals. Population changes and movements. One good example is, I, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but a few days ago, the world, 8 billion people the world's population was recorded as having reached 8 billion uh, people. 23 years from now, it will go to 16 billion, double of the population. And you can imagine what the half of that COVID cost with 8 uh, billion people. If we have a similar pandemic, there's a lot more people, more crowding, and more people to infect. So population changes and movements are an important contributing factor to pandemics. That's a hard lesson. Increased travel. We now travel more either by road, by air, by sea, more than any other time in human history. And that's a, an efficient way of spreading the epidemic uh, across uh, globally. We also have increased interaction between humans and animals. HIV virus came from chimpanzees. But because we've been invading the territory of our other animals, uh, the viruses and other pathogens are escaping from these animals and beginning to affect us. The same thing applies to simian viruses, which affect birds. So because we are, uh, we are displacing a lot of animals, we are inheriting some of the uh, viruses that would have caused infections uh, in these animals impact of human on ecosystem, and of course, there's a potential use of uh, pandemics being used as the biological weapons. What are some of the important environmental factors that we should take note of in terms of helping to prevent further pandemics? The, f the first one I've already mentioned, the global and regional population growth. Population movements uh, is um, an important one. Natural disasters. Uh, anytime there's a pandemic and there's a natural disasters, the pandemic spreads even further. Okay. Um, trade. You can, the only way you can trade bet you between different groups, human populations, is to, to meet them and exchange goods. Unfortunately, you also t tend to exchange uh, viruses or bacteria, which worsens, uh, increases the likelihood of pandemics. And then I'll just mention uh, uh, new pathogens. There have been new, two new viruses or pathogens uh, since 1975 that did not exist before. And this is all as a result of 
changes in our environment, ch climate change, uh, and a lot of other changes that we are causing uh, in the world. This is the population growth that I'm talking about. Uh, as, as far back as 1900, the population of the world was 2 billion. It has increased four times to 8 billion, the last few, uh, as I mentioned, in the last week. And it will go to uh, 23 billion, uh, sorry, to 16 billion in 23 years. That, we, that is going to make us more susceptible, susceptible to the next pandemic. Then and last, lastly, I'm going to, to briefly talk about some of the lessons that we've learned that should help us prevent uh, further epidemics. We cannot afford another COVID nor another HIV pandemic. Secondly, uh, we also, especially in Africa, where the level of healthcare is much lower, very few people can afford uh, to get sick. Uh, those who get sick, uh, the impact it has on their earnings, especially among the poor and the socially disadvantaged. The, the, we also, when we have a pandemic, we divest our resources from things that we should use for agriculture, we should use for transportation. We divert them to address the pandemic, and that obviously sets us back even further. Uh, we are also dependent on foreign assistance for the response, um, and it takes longer to recover from pandemic. We are still recovering from HIV, and it will take a while before we can recover from the COVID pandemic. So these are important lessons learned, uh, and they are even worse for Africa compared to uh, other countries, sorry. Another important lesson that we've learned, uh, and my previous colleague also touched, about, uh, touched on that, improve global, global coordination so that we can stop epidemic, a pandemic when they occur early. We have to detect them very early before they spread to more people. We have to set up surveillance systems that will uh, in different parts of the population that will identify and alert the authorities that this is starting somewhere. Um, and most importantly, when we do identify a new pan uh, pandemic, we have to put resources. It's more cost efficient to put a lot of resources at the beginning of the pandemic than to try and uh, stop an epidemic when it's already spread to uh, millions of people. Uh, we need to continue our research to identify new pathogens before they, they uh, migrate to humans. Uh, one of the areas where we've done very well is the improvement of diagnostic tests, effective therapies, and prevention strategies. Uh, and we need to uh, keep on working on that even further. Um, and then managing the social and economic cons consequences that invariably set back uh, uh, most of our society for um, for many years. This, I, I don't, I'm just showing the complexity. This is the global architecture for before COVID for coordinating activities around the world. It shows how complex this is, okay, how difficult it is to make sure that we can stop an epi epidemic like HIV or COVID uh, globally. So it's not an easy task, uh, but we are getting better at it. Finally, early detection intervention, reducing global transmission, our take-home messages, minimize social impact, reducing economic impact is key, um, ongoing vaccination research so that, so that we can develop uh, vaccines even before the epidemic spreads uh, extensively, uh, improving therapeutics, until now, we have very few drugs that actually work against viruses. We have drugs that work against um, bacteria and other uh, parasites, but not, uh, not many that work uh, against viruses. And most of the pandemics have been caused by viruses. One important thing that I would like to mention, that invariably all pandemics are accompanied by people spreading myths and false rumors. Um, when HIV started, it was called the gay plague, and that let us uh, prevented a lot of programs from getting off the ground. The same thing has been happening 
with uh, HIV, happen with HIV uh, um, as well as with COVID. Key conclusions, final conclusions, pandemics will continue to occur. They've been occurring for the, at least uh, the last 10,000 years and there's no reason why they will change. However, we need to be better prepared, as I said. Uh, we also have to have a, gl a global science-based detection, prevention, and interventions program. And then also global climate change appears to be an important contributing factor. But I'd like to end with some food for thought. The question that I'd like to pose to all of you, that are pandemics one of the sentences of a more serious global phenomenon? Uh, and this has been, goes, as, goes takes us back to what I consider, I'm not, I'm not sure how many of you will understand it, especially the students, but in the whole history of Earth, our planet, there have been five extinctions, meaning that extinctions that occur where percent of all the animals on the Earth have disappeared. 70 percent. You are talking of the first one occur occurred 44 and 40 million years ago, 85 percent all existing um, uh, animals disappeared. Another one occurred 365 million years later. Another one, 250. The last one, which some of you may identify with, is the extinction of the dinosaurs. They died 65 million years ago. But what a lot of scientists are now looking at, uh, they are claiming that actually pandemics are a symptom of the next extinction which normally lasts for millions of years. And these are the reasons why they think this is happening. Climate change, which we are, we are destroying the climate. Uh, we lost the polar ices. The South and North Pole have all, are all disappearing because of the warming of the climate. The pandemics that are occurring more often, populations that is too large for the Earth to support, excessive use of water, excessive use of energy. We are burning all the fossils, uh, fossil fuels, and then we are running out of land. And some people believe that this may be, uh, is the reason why we are having climate change and we are having pandemics as well. And this is what I meant by food for thought. And if the answer is yes, we will the human race survive this extinction unless we Make, take the, make the right decisions and reverse the, the trend. And I'd like to thank all of you for listening and for being part of this audience. But I also like to pay a special tribute to my family. My wife is here and my son, uh, my wife Theodora. Um, and that's because my work for the last 30 years has taken me away from my family. During the HIV epidemic, I was traveling six to eight months a year. Um, and they are the ones who bear the brunt of this, and I'm grateful. But I also like to pay to tribute, tribute to two members of the academy, Professor Samuel Fuswama and Professor Fresa, who are my mentors in public health. And uh, I'm grateful uh, for, and I hope that amongst all the students here who have new uh, uh, interest in this topic, and you help all of us have saved us, saved this world from ourselves. Thank you very much. Let's give him another round of applause. We shall use the same format where um, we will have, a, we can ask questions to Prof about his, his talk, and then he will collect a few of the questions, then he will answer them. So let's start. We also have um, an online audience, so please let us know if there are any questions 
from the online audience. Thank you. Thank you. I have, a, it looks like a very simple question. So forgive me if it is too simple. But I realized that as you talked about the earlier pandemics, they were pandemics of the skin, of the skin. Yes, it showed up on the skin. Um, but the more current diseases that are causing pandemics are becoming respiratory. Is there any reason why? And what do you anticipate the future pandemics to look like? Thank you, um, Professor uh, Peter Lamte, uh, for uh, this presentation. Um, I've had an opportunity to uh, work with Professor Lamte uh, for some time now. Um, thanks also for your mentoring. Um, my, my question relates to your um, final slide, the food for thought. Uh, there's an African wise saying that um, the future generations are not waiting uh, patiently or impatiently to inherit the present from us, but that we have borrowed the present from them. Um, it, it is an African uh, good attitude or virtue uh, to take care of things that we have borrowed. I just wanted you to uh, maybe a minute or 30 seconds, uh, let us here, um, the young ones, know how to take care of this borrowed resource, uh, our borrowed F, the F that we have today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lamte. Uh, during the, you know, well, I shouldn't say during because we are still in it. In the thick of the COVID-19 pandemic, I conducted, uh, you know, uh, some field work with a group of colleagues. One thing we noticed was that and it was about how to deal with myths and misinformation and things like that. And one of the things we noticed was that the deaf community, the hearing impaired, had been left out of the um, information that was being circulated. Since we are talking about preparations for the future, how would you propose we deal with this kind of uh, gap in information. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. Please, there's one question from online from Professor. Marianne in cancer. So she says thanks for a very wonderful, uh, a wonderful presentation. And her question is, to what extent did science advice influence the trend in COVID-19 in sub-Saharan Africa? To what extent did science advice influence the trend of COVID-19 in sub-Saharan Africa? Thank you. 
the first question was uh, whether we are evolving, well, the, the pandemic, the cause, causation of pandemics is evolving from skin conditions to more uh, respiratory, if I understand the question correctly. Uh, the, I think what's, uh, what is happening, some of the earlier ep epidemics were related to the lifestyle at that time. So, for example, um, the uh, bubonic plague uh, was spread by poor hygiene um, at that time. Uh, obviously, water was not readily available, soap was not readily available, so it was easy for it to spread. Uh, the other thing that was not available was antibiotics. Okay, as we evolved, uh, we had better response, better treatment, better hygiene, uh, more water available, and the new pathogen viruses. We still don't have. Uh, we haven't done very well. We can't. Most viruses we have no cures for. We have very few therapies that actually kill uh, viruses. So that's the reason from this sh shift from bacterial pandemics to viral pandemics. Uh, but we are getting better. I mean, uh, HIV, for example, uh, very few people die from HIV anymore. Because we, even though we can't cure somebody from AIDS, we can at least prevent them from getting the complications of AIDS, OK? Um, even COVID. COVID, as devastating as COVID is, look at the mortality. Only 4 million people have died, despite the fact that 200 million people were infected. So we are getting better, and I suspect that uh, probably in a decade or two, we may even have solutions for uh, treating viral infections, curing viral infections. Okay, so that's the answer to your question. Um, I think the second question was related to what we can do with young people, how can they take care of the, of the future? Actually, it isn't only the young people, it's the, the whole of current civilization um, that needs to make decisions. The decisions that we make today are going to affect the young because currently they are not even in a position to make those decisions. And um, the, uh, it's actually a more complex issue. It has to do with climate change. It has to, you, uh, to do with the way we use our current available resources. It has to do with the way we use land. People, land not only because we are going to use land to put our buildings, but land because we're using a lot of land for farming and we are displacing all the animals that are there and also the, some of the transfer of those pathogens. Um, I don't have an answer to that. It's a global phenomenon. Um, th th think of China. China has 1.2 billion people, okay? Think of India, another huge country. Those problems are compounded by those huge, huge populations, and it has to be a global effort. It has to be um, a coordinated effort because even if nothing happens in Ghana, we still can get viruses or other infections. Uh, it has to be a global effort. Um, the third question was about myths and misinformation. That actually, HIV continued to spread for years because HIV was seen only as a, it was called a gay disease. And more people didn't realize that it may have started in the gay population, but it was this disease that could affect it. So it went on for years before, because of the stigma and because of the myths. Uh, granted, they were more at risk, um, and the same thing has happened uh, um, with o o other pa uh, uh, pandemics. The one of the issues to address the question that was asked is how uh, how do we reach people that are easy are not are not easy to reach? It's not only the deaf; it's the illiterates. It's people who have don't have access to the modern communication. They don't have access to WhatsApp or TV. Uh, most of the communications uh, uh, reach the people who have the best access. 
and that's something that has to change. We have improved tre tremendously. Now information can spread very quickly through the and, uh, our, our networks that the only reach reaches people who have telephones, who have TV sets, who have radios, and yet there are a lot more people who we never reach with our messages. Um, and this is one of the things that we do in public. Uh, we do it very well, but it also requires a, a fair amount of resources to do that. The last question has to do, I think the one from Professor Marion. Um, I'm not sure I understood the question, but it was science. It's about uh, hearing impaired. The hearing impaired. Yes, can you repeat that question for me? Uh, it was the extent of science advisory on the, inf on the um, how, what was the role? Science of advisory. Of, of, of the experts advice in Africa, how did it impact the... Okay, um, no, I don't think it's specific to Africa. I think the science, uh, science advisory... Uh, I don't know how to answer that, but no, sorry. You, could, if I could, you can clarify the question for me. Yes, to be hearing impaired, that is the deaf. How do you help the deaf to understand the problem of COVID. That, that is how I understood the question. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, that, okay. So, so that, that was, I was only going to add that uh, our institution through the Ebeye Foundation funded the, the education on COVID to over 200 uh, people in all the districts of uh, Greater Accra, Central Region, and the Eastern Region. So that's what I wanted to advise. Okay. The question is saying, to what extent did science advice influence the trend in COVID-19 in Sub-Saharan Africa? To what extent did science advice, advice yeah. How did science advice affect um, the trends that we observed in COVID-19 in Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, the, I don't think this question is necessarily specific for, to, to Africa. I think there's, uh, there was a, one of the things that has happened with these pandemics is that science has got involved extensively and the whether it's the leading institutions that are doing the research or the public health institutions that are doing the interventions or countries, uh, every, virtually every country sets up uh, expert advisory groups in different countries. It happens in the US, it happens in Europe, and, uh, and then the World Health Organization and other UN bodies, they all come up with experts from different countries who can advise on key aspects of uh, most of these uh, pandemics. We have several of them in, in HIV, and there are several, uh, and they work both at the international level, they work at the country level, and hopefully they work at the lower levels as well. Uh, but these, you don't need to have a, an advisory group for everyone. Uh, the world, the whole world has become uh, information spreads across uh, more easily. So if, the, for example, uh, WHO does something, or the US, uh, the C Center for CDC, that information should be available for people in Ghana and for people in other places as well. Um, and that's what has happened in all these modern pandemics. The, somebody also mentioned about uh, science advice uh, oh, yeah, okay, okay. The hearing. I thought I addressed the hearing that it isn't only the hearing. 
all those are that are difficult to reach, whether they are people who are uneducated or illiterate, people who live in communities that are far away from the, the normal ones. Uh, we have to identify all these groups that are difficult to reach and find of reaching them more effectively. Or whether it's uh, uh, other forms of the telephone or other forms of communication, we have to make sure that we'll find ways to reach all of them. Uh, I'm not an expert on, uh, on the deaf, but I'm sure there are programs uh, that can be done for all levels of society, whether they are the uh, whatever the handicaps that they may, they may be. Okay. It's been very stimulating, and I'm sure we could go on for more and more time. Uh, there's a, a request for one question from our distinguished lady here. So please ask that to be the last question. for that excellent presentation. Um, am I doing? Um, my question was a follow-up to the answer you gave regarding how to reach the people who don't access the regular media. Growing up, we used to have these vans um, that would go to the villages and would broadcast various issues. And even within the villages, if there was any important information that needed um, to be reached, um, the linguist or the Ochiame would do the usual thing, we are Bodiru, and would go and communicate to the people looks like we've assumed that everybody has access to TV, radio, or phone, and so that's what we're focusing on. Maybe it's time for us to look at these hard-to-reach areas, because surprisingly, come election time, all those places get reached. People go and campaign in one form or the other, and they don't use um, TV or radio for those places. They go there in person and have a day bar or reach them. So can we look at these old tested methods that we've had in the past to communicate to people who are hard to reach? Thank you. Well, thanks for the question. Actually, we have used some of these methods extensively. And I'll give an example. We had a program called the Danfa Project. Um, yes. And we will go to a village and, and ask them, what, tell us, please advise us, what is the best way of reaching people with information? OK? We don't assume that we know. And they come up with in, uh, in the ingenious ways of reaching people. Um, um, and so that, that's actually it's not, uh, it's something that has been done extensively in family planning. It has been done in uh, uh, prevention, uh, child, uh, child welfare programs. Okay, It's been done in uh, pregnancy management. Uh, we did it for, with tra traditional birth attendants. We trained traditional healers. Um, I think we had about 200 of them trained in the Danfa Comprehensive Program. And they were very effective, much more effective than our nurses or our midwives. But the midwives and the nurses were the key contact people, and then we took it to different levels. So this is just one example. And if you go into India, you have different ways in which we can reach reach out the community. We, ha we had programs in HIV in 65 developing countries for 20 years. And we had some of the most effective programs uh, because we used the communities. They, they took the lead in showing us how, what the best way to do that. OK? All right. Thank you. Very good. Well, let's all clap.
it is always the exchange which makes these, me these meetings very uh, exciting because you begin to see that the, the group is actually articulating um, um, solutions and ideas for, um, for us all to learn from. Today's, talk, today's talks were, were quite informative. I picked up a few points that I wanted to just um, mention uh, as a way of um, uh, food for thought, as he put it. One was the paradox, the African paradox on COVID-19, the, the explanation. It seems that the jury is still out and they are still trying to figure out why is it that um, we did not get those high numbers as the other societies. So it's food for thought. And the first speaker talked about the need for us to conduct our own research. That was one of the themes that I think he kept, he kept highlighting. And definitely, it cannot be overstressed that when pandemics occur, everybody is very busy thinking about themselves. And they have no time or resources or the attention to solve your problems. You have to solve your own problems. So it is important that we be prepared long before the next pandemic breaks out. The other idea was that pandemics are repeating. And he gives a lot of historical examples of different pandemics that have occurred through time. And that um, there, there, are, there may be more on the way. Because we're not, we're not, hopefully we'll not be around to see <laughs> a major one like what we just went through in 2019, 2020. Um, then there was the idea of the socioeconomic impacts. Those are huge. In other words, it then, it then moves from the medicine or the biology to the economics and the society. And, the, and he gave us a lot of examples on the tremendous disruption that occurred because of the great lockdown and the shutdown of industry and the recession and um, Lo, lo, loss of jobs and all of that. And we all experienced it. So it's something that is very graphic. But then when you see it being um, analyzed for you, you realize that, yeah, that's really um, a huge impact. Then I like his last question on the, um, um, are we on the path to extension? Are these pandemics um, the, um, the signals or the warning that we should wake up and not follow the path we've been following. I think he, he referenced climate change, he referenced the population, gave us a, a projection what the populations would look like down the road. And you imagine there are, all these, there are going to be all these mega cities, cities with more than 10 million. When they count them, you find that there are 20 of them or so that would emerge in Africa. DRC has um, Congo has a lot of those big population centers, the Cairo's, the Lagos, um, where, else, where else are the big me me megalopolis in Africa? Accra? Accra? Well, we think Accra is small, but, you know, 10 million and over, you know, and um, Kinshasa and those places, um, Addis, you know. So anyway, um, so the, we, all, we all need to be alert that, uh, that we do something and um, you know the Galamsey issues and all of them do something to prevent, uh, to 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 moderate whatever happens in the next pandemic. That we don't accelerate it or we don't um, jeopardize our situation by destroying the environment we are in and so on. So I want to thank the speakers again for uh, enlightening us this evening, and um, we hope that tomorrow will also be another enlightening day on the same topics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for those um, closing remarks. And that brings us to the end of this evening's symposium. Tomorrow, we have the second day of this uh, week's symposium, and it will be at um, 5.30 p.
p.m. here in the auditorium. Join us again for two more exciting and informative lectures that are going to take place tomorrow on a, a sub-theme of our general theme, the socioeconomic and health impacts of COVID-19 and other emerging infectious diseases. Now, I'd like to acknowledge our fellows who are online. We often uh, lose track of uh, those who join us, who make time to join us online. So I want to acknowledge them. And of course, those of us here, um, thank you for making it here this evening for the uh, first day of the symposium. I'd particularly like to thank our young audience from Accra Academy. Accra Accra. Accra Accra. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, thank you for being here with us. I hope that you are taking a lot away with you because uh, you are, when we talk about preparing for the future, you are that future. And a lot will be up to you to help prepare for what is coming next. So thank you for being here. As we leave, there will be food that will be served uh, out in the foyer. Please remember to take a pack of food and drink before you leave. Thank you all very much. And please now stand while the chair and the speaker leave the stage. Thank you.